All right, so my name is Philip Mashek and I work as the spokesman of the zoo here in Prague, Czech Republic. So basically I'm in charge of anything that has to do with media relations. Um, I write press releases. I try to communicate what's happening in the zoo towards the public through the media. That's basically it. Well, the Przewalski horse is is the last wild horse on the planet. You know, sometimes people think there are actually quite a, a lot of wild horses or species of wild horses, like the Mustang in America. But the truth is that, um, for example, the Mustang is a domesticated horse that went wild again. But uh, the Przewalski horse from Central Asia is uh, technically the last surviving wild horse that was never domesticated. Well, historically, they were spread all over these, you know, vast steppes and deserts of uh, Central Asia. So you could find them in um, Kazakhstan, you could find them in Mongolia, in China and in all these countries. But, um, you know, due to a lot of reasons, they slowly went extinct um, in the 1960s because... Um, First of all, they would breed with domesticated horses, which is, uh, of course, wrong. And then the next generation, you know, you can't call it the Przewalski horse anymore. It's a different species. It's, it's going to be a hybrid. So that was one of the reasons. Uh, then, of course, they had to sort of escape the farmers and all the people who were building infrastructure there and farms and places for their domesticated horses. They sort of had to leave. And then during the 1950s, 60s, it was also the fragmentation of the population, because if you build roads and you, you then you sort of, uh, you know, invade uh, that, that invade the, the migrating routes. Uh, so for a lot of reasons, they went uh, extinct, and it's believed that the last horse that was seen in the wild was in 1969. In the 80s and in the 90s, uh, there were already some German projects of reintroduction of the horses to China and to Mongolia too. Um, but the main problem of these uh, was that some of the horses died uh, on the way. You know, it was very hard and, and there were some losses. So our absolute priority is that we, we can't lose a horse. We just don't want to lose not a single horse during the transport. And since 2011 uh, till 2019, there were nine transports to Mongolia. And this year, there was the first transport to Kazakhstan. And the ratio is, um, the ratio is 41-0. We transported 41 horses safely and we didn't lose a single one. The transport itself is extremely hard for, for anyone who participates. You know, there are dozens of people, uh, starting with vets, uh, keepers, soldiers, drivers, you know, uh, the pilots that actually fly the horses. It's extremely uh, hard for everyone. But if, if I go through the pro the whole process of the transport, that takes about 30, 35 hours. So we have to uh, choose the final horses because we have a lot of horses pre-selected, but then you have to sort of choose the right one that day because it can happen that one horse has an injury, the other one is, you know, uh, entered a breeding, uh, breeding uh, period. So, so you have to, you have to really pick the horses, the in the morning that day, the, the zookeeper with the curator and the vet, uh, they do it. So then they sedate the horses, but just um, to the extent that they could still stand because they have to be standing up the whole uh, route, the whole transport, they have to be standing uh, up. They can't sit down because of the blood circulation that could go wrong. And, you know, we could lose a horse because of that. So they have to be sedated uh, in order not to make them feel too stressed, but also uh, to the extent that they have to stand the whole way. So that is very, uh, very precise. And that is very, uh, we have to be very careful about that. Then they are loaded into these uh, big trucks. They are taken, uh, we take them uh, to the airport in Prague uh, from the breeding station, which takes about an hour and a half. Uh, we have um, police, the Czech police helping us uh, because if there would be a traffic jam or something, they could get us uh, through the traffic jam. Then they're loaded to the army planes, to the CASA army planes at the airport. And then they fly with two stopovers. 
because the aeroplane is actually quite small. So it has to take gas and they have to change, uh, switch the pilot at some point. So there are two layovers, two stopovers, one in Istanbul in Turkey and the second one in Baku in Azerbaijan. And then they land in Kazakhstan. Then we unload them from the plane in Kazakhstan to these giant trucks. They are basically on, on on the back of a giant truck and then the the journey continues because we have to take them to this most remote area we could imagine so so they can't meet domesticated horses so there you know won't be poachers and people who would um hunt them so then we drive for about eight hours with the horses to the step to this very very remote area and then the same day in the evening we, re we release them to this these huge acclimatization pens when they will spend um, 10, 12 months, uh, you know, getting used to those local conditions. So it is very complex. Yeah, we transported seven horses. We've, uh, or the original plan was to transport eight horses, uh, two stallions and six mares. But one of the stallions uh, named Pele, uh, he kept sitting down in the box. So just before uh, they were loading the boxes with the horses to the aeroplane, uh, the vet actually decided not to transport him because it could be dangerous for him um, because of the blood circulation. So uh, in the end, we transported seven horses, but all of them are safe. Uh, all of them are still in the acclimatization pens because now we have to observe if they if they eat well if they if they got used to the local uh, plants you know uh, we have to also check if they are if they learned how to drink water from the local lakes and ponds which are in these huge um, acclimatization pens too we have to check them for parasites we have to do some sort of um, tests from their dung to if everything is uh, well and then also we have to check if they got uh, if they get along, you know, if the horses uh, are actually working well in the herd, if the social structure is as it should be. So those are all the things we have to monitor. And the main one uh, is definitely the winter. We have to wait till the first winter and to see if they are able to dig up uh, food from under the snow. So the first winter will be crucial. And then in the spring, we release them to the wild. It, it's called the soft release. So we're just going to open the door of the pen and uh, they leave when they want to. So they're doing very well now. And we already observed some first um, breeding uh, activities. So uh, if all goes well, maybe next year there could already be baby Przewalski horses in Kazakhstan, the first ones after hundreds of years. Well, I was born here in Prague in the Czech Republic and I've always loved the zoo. We have a really nice zoo and I was always proud of it. Like always when I would have my, my friends from abroad coming here, I would of course show them the historical center of Prague and, and the good beer that we have here, the Pilsner. But then I would take them to the zoo and everybody was like, why, why, why a zoo? And I would always tell them, no, it, it, you'll see, it's the perfect place. It's a conservation place. We really try to reintroduce the species back and really push the message of the modern zoo. You know, and then I really wanted to be a zoologist, but then everybody was like, oh, there's no, you know, not, not much money in that. And you would have to be really good at mathematics too, because if you want to study natural sciences, you have to be good at this, 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 this. So the society sort of told me, no, 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 just don't work uh, in zoology. So I, I actually studied journalism. So through that, then I saw just an ad in, in a magazine uh, that the zoo is looking for a spokesman. And I kind of felt it's, it, it has, it's my destiny that, I had, that it has to be me because, you know, uh, I really, really wanted to work at the zoo or to help animals. Um, but then I started journalism. So this is the perfect job because you have to know the media landscape and the journalists. And you also and you have to know how to write and speak well. But then at the same time, you have to have passion for the zoology. You have to know the animals and you have to sort of have the, the, the message. Uh, clear. So, so that was my uh, that was my case, and the lesson is really just follow your dreams and like don't let anyone tell you not not to do something.